Hello and welcome to all of you who are joining us today. I'm John Feinblatt, president of Everytown for Gun Safety. And I'm Shannon Watts, founder of Moms to Men Action, the grassroots arm of Everytown. Today, Shannon and I have the honor of introducing a series we're calling Demanding Women, Quarantine Conversations About Gun Violence. Over the coming weeks, we'll talk with influential women leaders about an urgent question, how to address one of America's oldest public health emergencies, gun violence, in the middle of a new one, the coronavirus. No doubt there are still many questions about COVID-19, but this much is clear. The recent surge in gun buying brings a risk of three types of gun violence, domestic violence, suicide, and unintentional shootings, all of which occur behind closed doors. Addressing these challenges requires strong and visionary leaders, leaders with a track record of speaking up for those Americans who go unheard. Which brings me to our first guest, Stacey Abrams. Stacy is the founder of Fair Fight and the Southern Economic Advancement Project. She's the former minority leader of the Georgia House and a gun sense champion, if there ever was one, and a guiding light to every town and moms demand action. So with that, let's get started. I'll now hand it over to Shannon, who will take it from here. Thank you so much, John. You know, it really feels like getting back to Moms to Man Action's roots. Um, we're organizing and having so many important conversations virtually. And while we did not expect this moment, we are prepared for it. And I am so grateful to take the time to talk with some amazing women in politics. And I'm thrilled to start with Stacey Abrams today. Stacey, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. You know, when you ran for governor of Georgia, you sparked a national conversation on voting rights that led to the creation of Fair Fight, a powerhouse organization working to ensure every vote is counted. And you're one of the sharpest minds in politics. Uh, we need your voice now more than ever in the face of unprecedented hardships. And that really brings me to what we're talking about today. You know, these crises that face our nation affect all of us, uh, but they don't affect us equally. The coronavirus pandemic is exacerbating long-standing structural and systemic inequalities in our country, and those have sprouted from decades of discriminatory policies that lead to black and brown Americans getting sick and dying from COVID-19 at higher rates than their white peers. We're also seeing a tide of hate and harassment against the East Asian community due to the racist rhetoric peddled by the far right, including the NRA. And we've seen these trends before in another public health crisis in America, gun violence. Gun violence in the United States reflects and intensifies this country's longstanding racial inequalities in healthcare, housing, education, exposure to environmental hazards, and more. And Black Americans are disproportionately impacted by gun homicides and non-fatal shootings in the United States. And all too often, we've seen the deadly effects when hate comes armed with a gun. And these two crises don't exist in a vacuum. As we've seen in cities like Louisville, Chicago, Portland, the threat of gun violence isn't eliminated by shelter in place orders. And extremist groups often use times of crisis to recruit and further their deadly agenda. So we're here today to talk about the disproportionate toll that both gun violence and the pandemic are taking on black and brown communities. The danger of harassment against the East Asian community and the nexus between guns and hate crimes. These risks come with extremist narratives aimed towards selling more guns. And also we wanna talk about what we can do about it. So Stacy, let's dive in. We know that decades of discriminatory policies have created deep seated inequalities in American life. How are you seeing this manifest now, both in terms of the coronavirus pandemic and our longstanding gun violence crisis? As you said, Shannon, there's a deep and persistent intersection. We know that in the United States right now, African Americans and Latinos are the most likely to disproportionately be affected. In Georgia alone, African Americans comprise 32% of the population, but we're 54% of the deaths. And if you look around the country, you'll see that pattern repeated. And I also don't want to leave out the Native American community, which is also facing its own ravages. And in each of these communities, the African-American community, the Latino community, the Native American community, 
what we know is that access to to guns can exacerbate all of the underlying pathologies that we're concerned about. John mentioned them at the top of the conversation. We have to be concerned about domestic partner violence, where a, a, someone who is the victim of violent abuse will be 500 times more likely to die at the hands of his or her abuser if they possess a gun. But we also have to recognize that getting treatment, getting access to services is also diminished. The failure of our public health infrastructure system means that if you are a person of color, you are li less likely to have access to the help that you need. You can't go to a hospital. You're less likely to be treated. You're less likely to be tested. And that means that all of the challenges that you face in the midst of a pandemic get exacerbated. But on the other side, we also know that it's people of color who are the most likely to be frontline workers. They're the ones who have to go to work every day, to go to the grocery stores, to serve as health sanitation folks at our hospitals. They are in the positions with the least amount of power, the greatest amount of exposure, and the lowest likelihood of actually getting services. And so we have to recognize that with that comes a despair that can lead to suicide, can lead to a sense of isolation. And when you layer that on top of the true isolation that comes with social distancing, we have both a mental health crisis as well as a physical health crisis. Mm. And that's where gun violence becomes even more damaging and more destructive because you have access to something that allows you not to grapple with your challenges by either seeking out the help you need or getting the support you need, but instead turning to gun violence as a solution, which it is not. That's exactly right. And and we have a question along those lines from one of our volunteers. Um, she's a survivor of gun violence. She's a Moms Demand Action volunteer in New York City. She's also part of our Every Town Survivor Network. And her name is Marie. Uh, she knows firsthand the pain of gun violence and the pandemic. Her nephew, Pierre Paul, Jean Paul Jr., was shot and killed. And her two sons, TJ and Theo, were shot at or wounded. And now she has several loved ones who have been sick with COVID-19 and hospitalized. So here's Marie's question for you, Stacy. As a survivor of gun violence, I've made it my mission to tell my stories to lawmakers so they can understand the impact of the laws they pass on gun violence in America and to help other survivors tell their stories. How can we make sure lawmakers are listening, especially now, and really hear our stories? Marie, first of all, you have my deepest sympathy, not only for the loss and the violence that you've seen, but also for the challenges your families continue to face. We know that lawmakers have to be held accountable. I have developed a bit of a reputation for candor <laughs> because I know that in communities that are disproportionately affected, we are often not only overlooked, but people don't hear us speak. And so we have this responsibility to speak aloud the concerns that we have. In the midst of COVID-19, that does not exempt lawmakers from being held accountable. We have to do the work of reaching out, telling our stories, and when they're not heard, telling them again. I run three organizations. We are working on voting rights, working on the census, and working on economic resilience for the most vulnerable. When it comes to holding lawmakers accountable, this is the year to get it done. Because no matter what's happening, we're going to have an election in November. And lawmakers need to know what you are voting on. They need to hear from you and they can't escape you right now. Making sure we use the analog methods of phone banking and sending letters, holding people accountable and then telling each other whether we've heard back. Social media is an amazing opportunity to amplify messages, not just what you want heard, but who is listening. And so I encourage you to get your those who share your passion to start sharing your stories but also asking your lawmakers to respond in writing and by phone to tell you what they're going to do. We're going to have an election in November. I'm working hard along with a number of women and really good men to get this done, to make sure that we have the right to vote in November, but we have to have the right people to vote for, and that's the opportunity. That's exactly right. And holding accountable, uh, holding lawmakers accountable is kind of our specialty over at Moms to Men Action. So I'm glad you glad you raised that. Um, I'd like to move on now and talk about the disturbing rise in incidents of hate against East Asian communities. And much of this stems from racist rhetoric that is peddled by the far right, and in particular by the talking heads at the NRA. Um, and they're using this pandemic to fearmonger, to divide our communities, and of course, above all, to sell guns. So today we're joined by John Yang, who is the president and executive director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. 
John, welcome. How are you doing today? Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. John, can you talk to us a little bit about the incidents of hate you're seeing and how your organization is fighting it? Sure. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of incidents involving hate against the Asian American community. And I will note that I, I purposely say the Asian American community because it's not just directed at Chinese Americans. It's directed at our community as a whole. You know, those numbers are, are dramatic over a last eight week period. Several organizations, including mine, have been tracking these hate incidents online, uh, and we have self-reporting vehicles for doing that. And we tracked over 1,600 reports, and these are just self-reports of incidents that are happening. With respect to what we've seen in the media, you've, all of us have seen some of this. The more dramatic examples include a stabbing of a father and his two young children in Texas, uh, a, the dousing of acid by a woman outside of her own home in New York, and uh, people being beat up. You know, luck, luckily, in some ways, we've moved to distance learning because prior to that time, the number of children being bullied in schools, being pushed up against lockers, having their books slapped out of their hands, were, uh, frankly, very depressing. And you know, part of the problem of all of this also is that the fear that this has created within the Asian American community. Media articles have cited to the fact that Asian Americans in some places have started to buy guns more than people have seen in the past or the gun store owners have seen in the past. And that's a tremendous danger, especially in this time when we are sheltering in place. And the danger is that these individuals are not getting the proper training for how to store the guns, not getting the proper training and with respect to safety and to just think through the consequences of these actions. I think the other aspect for us that, that we're very concerned about does relate to suicide as well, is as we are in this shelter in place moment as Asian Americans are facing this anti-Asian hate to the extent that they have bought guns, what do they do with them? Several decades ago, I used to be a suicide hotline coordinator. And I, I, it doesn't escape me that May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And I, the, the notion that this is all connected and making sure that we do not have a rise in suicides at this moment is important and the importance of that as it relates to guns. So what are we doing? There's a couple of things that we can do. One is to speak out about all of this. And I appreciate uh, every town and Moms Demand Action at hosting this webinar, because that's important in talking about these issues and making sure that everyone is aware of them. The second thing is we are offering what's called bystander intervention training. This gives people tools, if they are physically comfortable doing so, to exercise if they see an incident of hate, to really to de-escalate that situation, not to escalate it. Small gestures that people can take to make that victim feel a little bit more protected. So we're offering these trainings throughout all of April and, and into May. Our first few sessions have had overwhelming responses. We've trained about 3,600 people just in the first two weeks alone. And we're hoping to see more people involved in this process because that's a way to empower people as well as to pe make people feel a little more safe. And John, you know, if every town and Moms Demand Action supporters and volunteers want to support your work, what's the best way to do that? Sure. Part of it is, again, to host these webinars at a smaller level as well within local communities to bring in your Asian American community as well, to make them feel like that they're being heard, make sure that they understand that, that, that all of you understand the pain that they are feeling, the fear that they are feeling. Because if there is no doubt in my mind that, that those people in all of our communities are feeling that fear. I mean, literally the fear of going outside to go to the grocery store and the fear of being spit upon, the fear of having a racial epithet thrown against them. So it's that those conversations alone, A, that can be helpful. And the B is perhaps a bystander intervention training for people that are interested, for, for people that are, are in your network that already are in some ways activists at heart is giving that set of tools to people who could meet, feel a little bit more empowered. Again, I, I want to emphasize, I don't want people to be superheroes. I don't want people to interject themselves into a situation where they are not comfortable, but at the same time, they're small gestures, whether it's just simply standing next to a victim and say, hey, are you okay? You're helping them to get to safety, directing someone to find a, a, a local authority that, that can help manage the situation. All of those little things will help that mental trauma 
that that victim is facing and make sure that people feel a little bit more protected in, in this situation. Stacey, the incidents that John just described are sometimes seen before far more deadly acts. And we know firearms don't cause hate crimes, but they can and do make hate crimes more deadly. In an average year, over 10,308 hate crimes involve a firearm, some more than 28 a day. So, Stacey, can you talk to us a little bit about how we can prevent extremist crimes during a time of crisis? I think John's absolutely right, because the first step is acknowledging that it's happening and speaking out about it. We know that hate crimes are not isolated. They begin with the villainization of one community and they expand Im immediately. And so I'm glad that he pointed out that it's the entire Asian American Pacific Islander community that's being targeted. But what that then leads to is this conversation about people who are other, people who should not be here. And we will see the spiraling effect and it layers with the deep sense of isolation that people feel, but it also feels like empowerment to those who think their hate is now unleashed. Mm -hmm. Our first responsibility is to talk about it. Our second responsibility is to hold our elected leaders accountable to also speak about it. It is one thing when we as average citizens say something aloud, but when someone is willing to put into law the protections that we need and to put the resources behind it, then we can start to see better solutions. And I'm so glad he mentioned, once again, the issue of mental health, because we have to recognize that these are, again, all intersectional issues that are deeply exacerbated by in communities with the least amount of resources. I know I live in a state that until recently had a law that said you could not wear a mask in public, which meant that for African-Americans, they risked very much losing their lives trying to protect themselves and those around them. We have to call out these laws, call out the lack of resources, but most importantly, believe that we have the opportunity to create change. Thank you, John, so much for your perspective today. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Stacy, as we come to our final minutes together, I have a few more questions from our social media feed. And I'd like to start with a broad question that I think actually many of us have. You know, you've been a leader on gun safety at the state level. Would you, what would you like to see happening in Washington, D.C. on this issue? And what do you think Democrats across the country should be campaigning on in 2020? Our campaign needs to be simple. We need to win America. We need to win it back from a leader who has said that he believes it's okay to demonize and villainize our community members. Someone who has promised action on gun violence and has refused to take it. But we know very quickly, we need background checks, universal background checks that do not have loopholes. We need to make certain that we have an assault weapons ban put back in place. It has worked before, it will work again. We need to follow the lead of Vice President Joe Biden and restore the Violence Against Women Act because that's not just a law, it's resources that go to protect families. And most of all, we need to elect leaders who are unafraid of declaring that you can believe in the Constitution and believe in gun safety. Shannon, when you and I first met, I talked about the fact that my great grandmother taught me how to shoot a shotgun. And she told me two things. One, you make sure that you don't point it at anyone. And two, you know that you are the one responsible for the actions that you take. And that responsibility is all that all of us seek. There is no one who believes in eroding the Second Amendment, but what we all believe is that no one should pay the price for someone's incompetence, someone's chaotic behavior, someone's hate, or their inability to discern right from wrong. We can end gun violence if we have federal leaders who are willing to take the stand and to stand behind what they've said. Because we've had a lot of folks who in small conversations agree, but when the time comes to vote, they don't do the right thing. We need to connect the dots and hold them accountable in November. That's exactly right. We're right there with you. So we have a question from social media. This is Julia, and she's a Students Demand Action volunteer. And she says, how can young voters help you with your work to increase voter turnout this fall, especially since turnout among young voters has been historically low? Thank you so much for that question. We have the chance to change the future with this election. And in 2018, in my campaign, we were able to increase youth turnout by 139%. And here's how we did it. Number one, we didn't just talk at young people. We talked to them and we brought them inside the campaign. So I encourage young people to get connected to campaigns. You have some time on your hands. And one of the most important and effective ways of changing the trajectory of a campaign is to be part of how the message goes out. Number two, 
It's making that the question that gets asked at every single forum. A lot of what's going to happen in the next few months will be online. That gives young people an edge over everyone. Your command of the digital space is unparalleled. Use that to hold lawmakers accountable and candidates accountable. But number three, have clear messages for what you want. Come up with your two to three messages. And I know students demand have already done this. We can make sure that people get that information. But the last thing is making sure people know it's going to be safe to vote. Fair Fight Action and Fair Fight 2020 are working to ensure that we have access to vote by mail, as well as in-person early voting and in-person voting on election day. Because we have to understand that if we can get as many people out of line by using vote by mail, that allows those who have no choice to come in and vote in person. Those are people who have disabilities, who have language barriers, who are homeless or displaced, and those for whom voting by mail didn't work. We need to be lobbying Congress to put the funds in place to pass in the next COVID package, the funds for our elections. If we want voter turnout, people have to believe it can be safe and accessible. And we know that the Klobuchar Wyden bill puts the structure in place and that Nancy Pelosi has promised to make sure she makes that a priority. We need to give her and all of our Congress congressional leaders support they need to make it real. Thank you. And I know that our Students Demand Action volunteers look up to you so much and admire your work. Um, I have a question now from Allison. She's a Moms Demand Action volunteer in New York. And she asks, what changes would you suggest to address the vast and disturbing inequities that have been made so clear by the COVID crisis? And, you know, I'd also note made clear by the disproportionate rates of gun violence. So, Stacey, what do you think about that? One of the other organizations I started is called Fair Count. Fair Count is focused on the 2020 census. And for a lot of us, that just seems like a statistical analysis. But what the 2020 census will do is allocate resources for the next decade, $1.5 trillion per year. If communities of color are undercounted, we stand to lose $8 billion every year that could go into our communities to help address some of these structural inequities. But we also have to call a spade a spade. We have to acknowledge that we have housing discrimination and environmental discrimination and healthcare discrimination built into our laws. We cannot fix what we will not acknowledge. And so my mission is to make sure that we are all lifting up these inequities and instead of treating them as necessary pieces of how we live our lives, we acknowledge that we are excluding so many important parts of our community from access and opportunity. And that goes directly to gun violence. We know that gun violence has a direct connection to poverty, to desperation, and we can solve those problems by calling out the disparities as they exist. But we must also participate in our own salvation, and that is participating in the 2020 census. If we get an accurate count, not only do we get access to the resources, the $1.5 trillion, we can also shape the legislative leaders, the congressional leaders, the school board leaders who will set the policies for the next decade. If we are silent, we're going to get what we've gotten. And I don't believe that's what we need for the next decade. That's exactly right. So before we go, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of elections, um, which I know is an issue near and dear to your heart. We all know the, the vast majority of Americans support common sense gun laws, and we need safe, equitable, effective access to the polls that will turn that support into real votes. Um, these principles are at their most vital, most fragile in this time of national crisis. So Stacey, you're a national leader on fair elections. What is your message to Americans about what they can do to fight voter suppression and to support the critical mission of your organization, Fair Fight Action? Voter suppression exists in three ways. One, can you register and stay on the rolls? Two, can you cast a ballot? And three, does your ballot get counted? Those issues exist in every single state. They may look different based on where you live, but that's how you know where voter suppression is. And so we have to, number one, put in place the resources we need in the next CARES package to make sure we can fund safe and accessible elections across the country. It will cost $4 billion. We've already gotten a $400 million down payment in the first COVID package. We need the balance. Number two, we need to call out local leaders and state leaders who are impeding our ability to run, I mean, to elect those we want to have represent us. We saw what happened in Wisconsin. That was both a tragedy and a travesty. No one should risk their lives to participate in our democracy. But most importantly, we have to recognize that voter suppression doesn't look like it did in the 70s or the 60s. It's not guns and hoses. It's bureaucratic hurdles. It's voter purges. It's restrictive IDs 
If you are transgender, for example, you may not have an ID that conforms to the requirements. Or if you are right now sheltering in place, you may miss the deadline for registering to vote. We have to recognize that in the midst of a pandemic, our laws have to meet the moment and our leaders have to do what they must to allow us to have accessible elections. I believe in our democracy. I believe that we can make the changes we need to make if we are willing to do the work now. One of the reasons I'm so happy to work with Moms Demand and with Every Town for Gun Safety is that this is about common sense. This isn't about asking for more than we deserve. It's asking for exactly what we deserve, which is an accessible and fair election, but also leaders who have to be responsive to the people who select them. And so I encourage everyone to go to fairfight2020.com to learn more about our work and to learn how you can help in your state because we're a national organization doing the work of protecting our elections and we need all the help we can get. We're there to help. Thank you so much, Stacy, and to our special guest, John Yang, for taking time today to have these really important conversations. You know, I think I speak for many of us when I say that Stacey Abrams is a ray of light in American politics, particularly in these unnerving times. Um, you are deeply thoughtful, thorough, and possibly one of the smartest people to have ever run for office. And we're just so grateful Great you're time. in this fight with us and, and thrilled you joined us today. And thank you to everyone who's tuned, tuned into Facebook and Twitter. Um, this has been the first in a series of conversations we're holding with inspiring women leaders. Next, we'll be talking to Senator Elizabeth Warren on May 4th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, if you want to get involved with Moms Demand Action, we make it super easy. Just text the word READY to 64433 and someone will get back to you very quickly and tell you how to plug in where you live. And then tell us on social media who you'd like to see on us uh, with us next using the hashtag DemandingWomen. So thank you so much for everyone to tune in. Thank you and stay safe. And remember, uh, little is more productive, persuasive, persuasive or powerful than demanding women. And Stacy, you're one of them. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Have a great day.